As a beer nerd, I try a lot of different kinds of beer out there. I drink all sorts of styles from breweries of almost any size, whether it's a small neighborhood tap room or a large nationally distributed beer I pick up at a local bottle shop. I love trying new and different exciting beers. And since I'm a millennial beer nerd, that means I have to log my beer adventures into an app like Untapped. And in the era that has more choices in beer than ever before, it's really useful to track what I have liked and what I have not liked in my many beer adventures. And while this information can be really useful, usually it gets me quite excited to go back through my old logs, but the other day I was looking back through and had the realization uh, that actually made me quite sad. I probably am not going to revisit a lot of the beers I've checked in before ever again. And this is kind of the dark side of variety and change that exists in the beer industry today. While it's new and exciting when you find a great beer you've never had before, we also have to recognize that many of the beers that we find that we love will probably never re-enter my life again. So today I want to honor some of those beers, those great beers that I fell in love with. Uh, so if you want to follow along with my scores, uh, check out the link in the description below to my untapped profile. You're going to find a lot of mediocre beer reviews over there, and I know you're going to want to see those uh, if you decide to be my friend on the app. All right, so enough pseudo-philosophical garbage to start off this video about the fleeting nature of life. Let's talk about some beers. I want to start with a beer that was sent to me by my good friends here in the BrewTube community, Max and Chris from Hops and Bros. Last year, they teamed up with, and excuse my butchering of this pronunciation, Tuc de Brewery, a, a brewery in Ontario, and made a great Harvest IPA. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Harvest IPA beers, I put a link to their video on the subject in the description below, and it's definitely worth the watch after this video is done. But Harvest beers use fresh brewing ingredients almost immediately after they're harvested in the fall. It's hard for brewers to get such quick access to these ingredients, so I was very happy when they decided to share a special Harvest IPA with me. It was a wonderful beer with great pine and citrus flavors and a really good resiny burst at the end. But I think what I liked most about it was that it had a, just a little hint of smoke on the finish. As any good New England IPA fanatic will tell you, the freshness of the beer is everything when it comes to these really ultra flavorful IPAs. And while it might be hard for your typical beer drinker to understand the ridiculous importance of that freshness, uh, crazy nerds like me will tell you about it all the time. But this was the beer that really taught me that it was important to use fresh ingredients for fresh beer and have pretty quick distribution. Unfortunately, this beer was a limited run by the brewery, so unless the guys over at Hops and Bro have another cool collaboration up their sleeve, I probably won't be able to get my hands on this great beer again. If you've been watching this channel for a while now, you've probably heard me talk about beer tourism at some point. And as a major beer nerd who loves to travel, I always have to check out the local beer scene in whatever city I wind up in. Uh, my craziest beer trip was to Denver about a year and a half back, where I hit up 12 breweries in about four days. And at one of these local small places, I found a brew that I absolutely fell in love with. Black Shirt Brewing in Denver's trendy Rhino neighborhood is almost everything you'd expect from the Denver beer scene. A uh, really great beer in a cool industrial-esque space full of hipsters and a small stage for some local artists to play on. Uh, but one of the beers there really stood apart in my mind, and that was their Blood Orange Overdrive, an amazing double IPA. They ferment the beer twice, and the second go-round of fermenting, they put in a just a ton of blood oranges. Then they double dry hop it with mosaic to give it a really amazing hop character that pairs pretty expertly with the blood orange. 
Now they still brew this beer today, but as a beer traveler, I'm always on the lookout for something new when I'm in a different city. So that being said, I would probably choose to explore a new area of Denver's beer scene rather than go back to the Rhino neighborhood. In addition, one beer is not always enough to get me to revisit a brewery. If I ever end up back in Denver, you bet I'll make an effort to head back to Left Hand or Great Divide, but I'm not sure about the much smaller black shirt brewing and whether or not that'll make my list. And you know, that's a little sad to say, but you know, such is the life of the urban beer explorer. Have you ever had a beer from one of the big national brands that you're pretty sure will never taste the same again? With the growing popularity of things like Harvest or Fresh Hop beers, the consistency of beer is really being challenged by craft brewers. Think about it. For hundreds of years, all brewers were trying to do was to desperately innovate so that their technology and their brewing techniques would make more consistent products. But beers like Lagunitas Born Yesterday Pale Ale doesn't really care about such things. That's because this delicious pale ale doesn't just use fresh hops, which can vary in flavor from season to season. No, they take it one step further and try to use virgin hops, that is, hops from a first producing season of a new hop vine. Now, I had this really cool concept of a beer in 2016, uh, but as I was drinking it, I pretty much had to acknowledge that even if the brewer wanted to make the beer that tasted exactly the same, that they weren't gonna be able to. And that's not to say this is a, a bad beer. In fact, it's on this list specifically because it was really, really good. Uh, but the beer I rated is not gonna be the same one I could get here in 2018 or beyond. There is a bright side, however. You know, the 2018 version might just be even better. So I guess I'll have to go find a bottle of that and report back. Part of the thing that makes this the golden age of beer is that brewers are quick to adopt uh, popular news, trends, styles, and brewing techniques. And although many beer nerds lament that brewers are selling out by chasing different trends, it's pretty freaking nice that I don't have to buy a plane ticket to Boston just to get a New England style IPA. So yeah, let them chase the trends a little bit. The hard part about it is that most craft brewers only have a certain amount of brewing capacity. So choosing to chase a trend like pumpkin beer or brute IPAs usually means you aren't gonna be brewing something else your fans love. And that's the situation I find myself in for this next beer, the Buddy Check Session IPA by Lake Monster Brewing out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Now, this beer itself isn't particularly well known. It's from a pretty small brewery in a middling sized beer market, but trust me when I tell you, it was one of my favorites. It had a crisp, malty body, balanced perfectly with a blast of citrusy hops and bitterness, and was perfect because it was a great session beer. I would order one every time I go to the brewery, and I still know several beer tenders there, so I guess I kind of drank this beer a lot. But then they changed it to a hazy IPA. Now don't get me wrong, I totally understand this business decision. The original beer wasn't all that far off in flavor from a hazy IPA, and it probably wasn't one of their best sellers as a session IPA to begin with. But as a hardcore fan of that beer, it was a big blow to me that I will probably never get the original version of that beer ever again. Finally, have you ever gone on a trip somewhere or went to a bar or club or something or maybe a specific event and had a really great time, but you just know deep down that you're probably never going to go back because the newness or the gimmick's going to be worn off and it won't be as good? Well, that's how I feel about Rogue's Hazelutely Choco Tabulous. Now look, it's a great stout from a great brewery. There's no doubt about that. It has a wonderful chocolate and hazelnut flavors and they're blended together and it basically tastes like a candy bar in a bottle with some alcohol thrown in. But I just don't feel any compulsion to try this one again. Like if I were in a bottle shop and in the mood for a great stout, I would probably try something new in the hopes of it blowing my mind rather than going back to this admittedly pretty great beer. 
I guess the only reason I have to believe I'll never have it again is that I don't want to give up on that first time charm I remember about this beer. Good reason or not, I think we've all experienced this feeling about something new at one point or another in our lives. So there you go, beer nerds. Five great beers I will probably never have again. What's a beer that you don't think you'll ever get to taste again? Let me know down in the comments section below. And if you're a BrewTuber, why not make a list of your own? That's right, I just called like all 300 of you out. Keep going. Anyway, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next week with some more limited edition beer content. Cheers.